transportation operator is one, its eigenvalues are either plus one or minus one. Okay? We call these things even if, they if they're eigenstates of permutations with eigenvalue plus one and odd if they're eigenstates of permutation with eigenvalue minus one. Well, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. There are the, the spaces divided into subspaces, which are the basis spaces for the various irreducible representations. But, but when we have the representations of the rotation group, wouldn't they all just... Um, well, you, it depends. I mean, multiple, multiplied by the exchange on the left and on the right, you get one. That's right. It commutes with the exchange. Okay. The point is we can block diagonalize D of R, the product representation. Okay, so there'll be some D1 of R, some, I'm just answering questions now, D2 of R, 0, 0, etc. Okay, and at the same time, we can block diagonalize the exchange operator. Okay, it'll be plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, etc. Okay, with, with in, in the This is it's a two-particle system, and this is the operator that exchanges the two particles, okay? Or it could be, if I don't want to talk particle language, it's two fields which I have multiplied together to form all possible products, and I imagine exchanging the two fields, okay? What is even and what is odd depends on which of these things it's, it's hooked up with. In particular, when I put together two things of spin S, to produce a system of 2s, the subspace of states that form the basis for the representation of spin 2s is even under exchanges. That which forms the basis for the representation 2s minus 1 is odd under exchanges, etc. It's not an intrinsic property of this representation. Spin 1 could occur as putting together spin 1 half and spin 1 half, in which case it's even, or as putting together spin 1 and spin 1, in which case it's odd. Okay, but there is a rule for which is even and which is odd when you take the product of two I things that transform identically, in which case it's sensible to define an exchange operator. Okay? Other questions? All right. Well, it's a good thing that question was asked because we're going to use the concept of an exchange operator in uh, our, our symmetry under exchange. In answering our seventh and final uh, questions of the seven questions I said I would answer about the representations of the um, Lorentz group, 031, and that is, where are the tensors? Vectors we know, we showed at the end of last lecture, transformed according to uh, the representation one-half, one-half. That is to say, the set of all vectors form a four-dimensional vector space on which the Lorentz group acts by its linear transformations, and that representation of the Lorentz group is equivalent to the representation d one-half comma one-half. We now want to do the same thing for tensors. That is to say, objects like t mu nu, whether I write the indexes upper or lower, uh, it doesn't matter, of course, that's just an equivalence transformation with G being the matrix, that the metric tensor being the matrix that affects the equivalence transformation. T mu nu forms the, a set of all two index tensors, T mu nu, forms the basis for a 16-dimensional representation of Lorentz group. If I take such a tensor and Lorentz transform it in the standard way, I get a 16-dimensional 16 linearly independent objects will shuffle up among themselves according to the Lorentz transformation I have made. Therefore, this defines some representation, D of lambda, some 16 by 16 matrix. What it is depends on how I choose a basis for the 16-dimensional space of tensors, which uh, I want to find out what it is in terms of irreducibles. Now, Tensor, of course, is an object that transforms like the product of two vectors. So therefore, d of lambda is not equal to, is equivalent to, well, equal if I choose an appropriate basis, which 
let's check our dimensions. 4 times 4 is 16. That's right. <laughs> the, uh, which in turn, by our uh, product um, algorithm, is d11 of lambda plus d10 of lambda plus d01 of lambda plus d00 of lambda. For the rotation group, adding 1 half and 1 half gives you 0 and 1. And here we're adding 2 1 half, doing two such sums independently and getting all possible terms. Now, let's check that this is right by adding up the dimension. The dimension of this is 9, 3 times 3. The dimension of this is 3, 3 times 1. The dimension of this is 1 times 3, also 3. And the dimension of this is 1 times 1, which is 1. And indeed, 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 is 16. We also know how these things transform under symmetry or anti-symmetry. That is to say, when we exchange the two indices here, which corresponds to exchanging the two vector fields, if we think of this as a product of two vector fields. This one is symmetric, because this is symmetric and this is symmetric. This one is anti-symmetric. This one is anti-symmetric. And this one is symmetric, because it's anti-symmetric in both the first and the second. This will give us a clue on how to do things. Thus, the general theory of the Lorentz group says that we should be able to break the 16-dimensional space up into a 9-dimensional subspace, the two 3-dimensional subspaces, and a 1-dimensional subspace, such that when we apply the Lorentz transformation, a tensor constructed out of basis tensors in any one of these subspaces goes into a tensor in the same subspace. The things in different subspaces don't talk to each other under Lorentz transformations. They each transform independently. That's what the direct sum means. Now, let's try and figure out what this breakup is in traditional tensor language. Firstly, every tensor can certainly be written unambiguously Symmetry gives us a big clue to start out as a sum of a symmetric tensor and an anti-symmetric tensor. S mu nu is 1 half T mu nu plus T nu mu. And A mu nu is 1 half T mu nu minus T nu mu. Since the two indices transform identically, if I start out with a symmetric tensor and apply a Lorentz transform, I get a symmetric tensor. And if I start out with an anti-symmetric one, I get an anti-symmetric one. So this is a Lorentz invariant breakup. Thus, I have written my representation as a direct sum, part that acts on the space of symmetric tensors and part that acts on the space of anti-symmetric tensors. So this block diagonal, the Lorentz transformation will never turn an anti-symmetric tensor into a symmetric one, and vice versa. How many linearly independent symmetric tensors are there? Well, we always know that. That's 4 n times n plus 1 over 2, which is 4 times 5 over 2. So this is 10-dimensional subspace. And this is a 6-dimensional subspace. Let's check that with our algorithm. We see we have a 10-dimensional 9 plus 1 symmetric subspace and a six-dimensional 3 plus 3 anti-symmetric subspace. So, so far, things are checking. Of course, neither of the, we haven't completed the reduction process. The 10-dimensional subspace should be writ written as a direct sum of a 9 and a 1, and the 6 should be written as a direct sum of two 3s. Well, let's go on. Let's consider a symmetric tensor. We can break this up, if we think of it as a matrix, into a traceless part and a part proportional to the identity matrix. To be more precise, we can write it as S mu nu 
minus 1 quarter g mu nu s lambda lambda plus 1 quarter g mu nu s lambda lambda. And I will call this part s mu nu hat. S mu nu hat is, uh, has, obeys the equation s hat mu mu equals 0. Just compute it. It's trivial. <laughs> Thus, we have a broken this up into a one-dimensional subspace, symmetric tensors that are proportional to g mu nu, and a nine-dimensional subspace, what's left over traceless symmetric tensors. Again, under the action of the Lorentz group, if a tensor is proportional to g mu nu, it stays proportional to g mu nu after the transformation. And if it's traceless, it stays traceless after the transformation, because these are Lorentz invariant equations. So we have block diagonalized the representation. By trace, you mean the sum of the 1, 1, 1 Yeah, right, if you write it in terms of lowers, the Lorentz analog of the trace. The, um, thus, um, well, we finished according to our general algorithm. The s mu nu hats, traceless symmetric tensors, form the basis space for the nine dimensional representation. This is the things that transform according to d11 of lambda. And these objects, of course, are simply unchanged by Lorentz transformations, that being the definition of the Lorentz transformation, that it doesn't change the metric tensor. <laughs> so these are, of course, the trivial scalar representation, d00 of lambda. Any questions? The breakup of the anti-symmetric tensor is a little trickier, because we normally don't think of an anti-symmetric tensor as being the sum of th three, two three-component objects. We've play you've played with anti-symmetric tensors a lot in electromagnetic theory, I hope, where the electromagnetic field, form E and H, forms an anti-symmetric tensor. And you don't think of it as being broken up into the sum of, three, of two three-component three objects, each of which transforms only into itself under the action of the Lorentz group. But actually, the reason you don't think of it is that these representations are not real. They're complex conjugates of each other, as we showed last time. And um, the, um, the uh, breakup will, in fact, involve complex combinations, therefore, of the components of the anti-symmetric tensor. I'll demonstrate how that goes. <coughs> For any anti-symmetric tensor, I will define its dual and I'll put in a one half here for the result that it, to take care of the fact that in such a sum there is um, always a, uh, a double counting lambda sigma and sigma lambda. This is a Lorentz invariant way of associating one anti-symmetric tensor in a linear way with another. Just to see what the dual looks like, A01 dual equals epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3, A23. It's the only non-zero combination. The other one gives you the same thing again, which is A23. Therefore, A01 lowered dual is because of the two minus sign, one plus and one minus sign in the lowering operation, minus A23. Now let's dual again. What is the double dual? <laughs> OK. A23 double dual. Don't know how to write it. Uh, A dual dual 2, 3 equals <laughs> epsilon 2301. That's still a cyclic permutation, so that's a positive, that's plus 1. A 
a zero, a dual, zero, one, equals a zero, one. Now when I lower the indices, I've got two space-like indices to lower, so I get two a dual, zero, one, thank you. I have two indices to lower, so I've got a two, three, dual, dual, equals a zero, one, dual, equals minus a two, three. Of course, there was nothing peculiar about the set of indices 0, 1, and 2, 3 I have picked out. For any ten component, I have this operation of first putting in an epsilon and then lowering the index, which defines the operation of forming the dual. And I have the pr property that a dual dual mu nu equals minus a mu nu. Now, now, the property of forming the dual of a tensor is ob the operation of forming a dual of a tensor obviously commutes with all Lorentz transformations, since the epsilon does, and certainly lowering indices does. Therefore, I have an operation defined on the six-dimensional space, a linear operation, which has the property that a square is minus one. Thus, I can form eigentensors. I can take any six-dimensional vector, six in this, any six-dimensional object in this vector space, and write it as a sum of eigenvectors of this operation, which has eigenvalues plus and minus i, since the square is minus one. That is to say, I can write any a mu nu as the sum of a mu nu plus plus a mu nu minus, where plus or minus dual equals plus or minus i a mu nu plus or minus. These are eigen tensors of the dualing operation of forming the dual. Yes, sir? Uh, I know you had this before, but I'm still a little confused. When you say the representation is symmetric, you mean the matrices themselves are no, I mean that there, if, I, if I'm taking the product of two identical representations, I can define an operation in addition to Lorentz transforming of exchanging the two objects I'm taking the product of. And I mean that the subspace that forms the basis for this given representation is some, also is simultaneously an eigenspace of the interchange operation. Okay. Uh, sorry, the syntax came out off tangled. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. It's not, if you know, it's, I'm not talking about the symmetry of the representation matrix. The wire I, seems to be disconnected. Yes, it is supposed to. That makes it a good antenna. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if I rolled it all up into a little ball, it wouldn't. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, um, would you like to have a suggestion for a more graceful posture? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the, um, it's a symmetry, if you know in the theory of the rotation group what a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient is. It's a symmetry of the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient I'm talking about, not of the representation matrix. Okay, it's the symmetry of the Klebsch, for example, if I put together two plus spin one half objects to make a spin one, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient is, is symmetric under interchange of the two spin one half in this, uh, 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 indices. If I put them together to make spin zero, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient is anti-symmetric. Okay, is that, that cleared up in your... Now, therefore, we have these two kinds of objects, each of which form a three-dimensional subspace of the six-dimensional space. And they are, of course, the representations 1, 0, and 0, 1. I will not bother to work out which is which. <laughs> this concludes the discussion of the tensors. To summarize, 
a vector forms, transforms according to the representation 1 half, 1 half, a scalar according to the representation 0, 0, a traceless symmetric tensor according to the representation 1, 1, an anti-symmetric tensor according to the reducible representation 1, 0, and 0, 1, sum of 1, 0, and 0, 1, which we can reduce if we are willing to form complex combinations. Now, um, to get um, some exercise, in, uh, we are now in the position to start taking the simplest of these representations that have a chance of representing particles of spin 1 half and uh, making um, uh, field theories out of them. In the first instance, of course, field theories that will have linear equations of motion, so we'll have theories of free particles. And then after we quantize them, we'll start adding in interaction terms following the policy of the first part of this course and develop theories of interacting particles. Certainly, the simplest representations we can work with that have a chance of describing particles of spin 1 half, they must reduce to poly spinners or some such objects when we reduce ourselves, when we restrict ourselves to the rotation group. And uh, the simplest ones we can deal with are the representations d one half zero of lambda and d zero one half of lambda. These are two-dimensional representations of the rotation group. The um, L, in these two cases, is sigma over 2, j plus plus j minus over 2. And M is plus or minus i sigma over 2, the plus sign applying in one case and the minus sign applying in the other. Thus, for example, if we take an object, for the moment I will suppress the spatial index or imagine that we're at the space point zero before I build a field. If I take an object call it u plus or minus, depending on which of these two representations it transforms according to, is an ordinary two-component poly spinner. And under rotation, u plus or minus transforms, just like a poly spinner, whether it's the plus or minus sign, e to the minus i sigma dot e theta over 2 times u plus or minus. Because no matter which case we're looking at, this L is always a sigma over 2. On the other hand, under an acceleration, this is, of course, the axis and this is the angle, U plus or minus, the two objects transform differently, going under into e to the plus or minus. I'm multiplying this thing by minus i. Sigma dot e phi over 2 u plus or minus. Thus, these are two component objects, which each of which transforms according to some irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. And they are called vial spinners. Not that they are disgusting, but that they were first explored <laughs> by Herman Weil. <laughs> Let's just check that our, all of our things are right by trying to see what we can build out of U plus and U plus adjoint by putting together bilinear forms in U plus and U plus adjoint. And then also, of course, everything I say with some trivial sign changes will go for the minus case. Suppose I were to make, put together a bilinear form. There are, of course, four linearly independent ones out of u plus and u plus adjoint. u plus transforms, let us say, like d, I factored d 0, 1 half, that is u plus. But that's irrelevant because the conjugate object transforms like d 1 half, 0. <laughs> So whether it's plus or minus, it doesn't matter. One is the conjugate and the other is not. And this is, of course, simply g 
d one half one half, which is the transformation law for vector, as we've seen earlier. Therefore, if I put together bilinear forms in u plus and u plus adjoint, they should make a vector. The four independent bilinear forms should transform like the four components of a vector. Well, let's work out what that precisely what that vector is. Certainly, there's only one possible choice for the time component. I'll write it as a contravariant vector. That's u plus adjoint u plus. That's certainly the only thing which is a scalar under rotations from the ordinary theory of spin one-half particles. There's likewise up to a multiplicative factor, which I'll call alpha, and I'll calculate in a moment, only one possible choice for the three space components. Our general formalism hasn't led us astray, at least so far. The four bilinear forms we can make can indeed be arranged un into an SO3 scalar and an SO3 vector, which is what we want for a four vector. Now let's work out what happens under, is there any question here? I notice some people looking bl blank eyed. What do you mean by the single with usually with the plus and the plus? Adjoint. Please, I'm sorry, I just don't have enough, a large enough font in this hand to use different. If I could try and make this long so you'll know it's an adjoint. This is ordinary Pauli spinner notation. U plus adjoint, U plus, U plus is a two vector, U plus adjoint, U plus is a scalar, U plus adjoint, sigma U plus is a, a set of three numbers. The, uh, now, let's try and figure out how these things transform by applying an acceleration, say, about the z-axis by an angle, by a uh, hyperbolic angle, phi, and seeing if everything transforms right. Of course, it must for the appropriate choice of alpha, but it's amusing to work it out and also to fix what alpha is. A of e sub z phi turns u plus, we read it off here, that's the one with the plus sign in the formula, e to the sigma z dot e phi over 2 u plus. Uh, right, no. Likewise, u plus adjoint, we just take the adjoint equation, u plus adjoint. And this is now a Hermitian matrix. That's the difference between Lorentz transformations and uh, rotations, where there's an I for rotations. So this thing just gets adjointed. Now let's work out what happens to the four components of our putative uh, vector and see if they indeed transform like the components of a vector should transform. zero is u plus adjoint u plus. Well, we know how u plus transforms, and we know how u plus adjoint transforms, so we just stick it in. The one half disappears. This is a very easy matrix to compute since the even powers in the power series expansion are proportional to 1, sigma z squared being 1, and the odd powers by the same token are proportional to sigma z. Adjoint, the even powers give me cosh phi, the odd powers give me sinh phi. This is cosh phi v0, which is just what we want, of course, plus sinh phi v1, if we choose alpha equals 1, so v1 is simply u adjoint sigma z u. Any question? 
This is just what we would want the components of a vector to do. And we have fixed alpha to be one. People are looking blank. They don't understand it. No, everyone understands. Okay, now let's check the other components. We've taken care of the only freedom we've got, so let's look at V1 or V3. That's an intro. Oh, sorry, I, now I know why they're looking blank. I wrote one when I meant three. <laughs> V3 equals U at plus adjoint. Now fixing alpha equal to one, U th V3 equals U plus adjoint, sigma three U plus goes into U plus adjoint. Here again, sigma z commutes with sigma z. So, so I simply have e to the sigma z phi sigma z u plus. <coughs> and again, I can use the same expansion, u plus adjoint, cos phi, now times sigma z, plus sinh phi times sigma z squared, which is one, equals cos phi v3 plus sinh phi v1. Again, the right answer, v0, excuse me. Again, the right answer. What about v1 or v2? Those are supposed to be unchanged under an acceleration in the z direction. Well, v1 or 2 equals u plus adjoint sigma x or y u plus, which goes into u plus adjoint e to the sigma z phi over 2 sigma x or y e to the sigma z phi over two, u plus. Now, sigma z and sigma x, or sigma y, anti-commute. And therefore, when I bring a sigma z through a sigma x, it gets turned into a minus sigma z. So this equals sigma x, y, e to the minus sigma z, phi over two, e to the sigma z, phi over two, u plus. And of course, this combination is known to its friends as one. <laughs> and the result is u plus adjoint sigma x y u plus, which is in fact equal to v one or two. Thus, everything works out just the way it should. Of course it does. I don't make mistakes, but still. <laughs> Still, it is reassuring to see the marvelous algebra of the poly matrices doing our job for us and enabling us to construct this two-component object, which has a sensible transformation law not only under rotations, but under Lorentz transformations. Exactly the same reasoning applies for U minus except because of the minus sign in the sigma matrix, if we were working out u minus, the corresponding vector object, of course, a completely different vector than this. This is a completely different field, but the thing that transforms like a four vector would be u minus adjoint u minus minus u minus adjoint sigma. U minus. <coughs> Are there any questions about the computations? This is how a vial spinner transforms, and from the product of a vial spinner and its adjoint, you build a vector, and which of the two different kinds of vial spinners you're working with only affects the sign of the, of the uh, space component of the vector. Now let's try and build a free field theory using a U plus object only. Let's promote these things from uh, two component objects to two component functions of space and time fields and attempt to build a free classical field theory. 
I'll do the U plus case in detail, and then I'll just tell you what the answers, how the answers change when if it has a U minus field. This will be our first stab at making a Lagrangian for spin one-half particles. Now, every known spin one-half particle is associated with some conservation law, either the conservation of baryon number or the conservation of lepton number. And uh, therefore, I might as well only consider free Lagrangians that obey that conservation law. So I will demand invariance under a phase transformation. with arbitrary theta, since we know from our previous experience that it's such phase transformations that give us such conservation laws in scalar field theories. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to obtain linear equations of motion. So um, I want uh, my Lagrangian to be quadratic, and since I also want it to be invariant under phase transformations, L linear in U plus and its derivatives, of course. And linear in U plus adjoint and its derivatives. That'll simultaneously give me linear equations of motion and guarantee invariance under the phase transformation. Finally, for simplicity, since in the scalar case I was able to get by with no more than uh, two derivatives in the equations of motion, I will say no more than two or derivative squared or by integration by parts of second derivative, three, just for simplicity. L equals of u plus d mu u plus u minus d mu u minus. Just to keep things with our general formalism, I'll demand only more, or no more than two powers of derivative in any term in the Lagrangian, one differentiated u. Oh, I don't, yes, adjoint, I'm sorry. Thus, we can have four, in principle, three kinds of terms allowed by this. We could have a term involving a u plus adjoint and a u minus put together, a u plus put together in some way. We could have a term involving a u plus adjoint, a derivative somewhere, and a u plus put together in some way. And we could have a term involving a u plus adjoint and two derivatives on a u plus, or by integration by parts, one derivative on each. <clears throat> these are just generic. We don't know, however, whether these will obey condition four. L is a scalar, because we want a Lorentz invariant theory. Well, let's see. What is consistent with the possibilities of a scalar? This object, we've already shown, there are four linear combinations, and none of them transforms like a scalar. They transform like the four components of a vector. And there ain't no way of putting together the four components of a vector to make a scalar. So, no terms of type A. That's pretty grim. It doesn't look like this will be a very interesting theory because we would expect from our previous experience that we would get a, um, a, um, a mass term from such a thing, and it looks like we'll only be able to construct a theory of massless particles. Also, we know that uh, we uh, aren't going to be able to implement parity in this theory. 
because to get parity, we need both a U plus and a U minus. So we'll get a theory of massless particles that is incapable of admitting parity. Well, after all, neutrinos exist, so <laughs> let's, let's go on and see uh, where we can go with this. And then after we've explored this, we may try more complicated theories that will work for par have a chance of working for particles other than neutrinos, like electrons or protons. <laughs> By the same token, we can't build a, uh, par a uh, term of type C. Because the deriv derivative operator is a vector, the bilinear forms are also all transformed like vectors. And out of three vectors, there is no way of building a scalar. You can build a vector or some crazy kind of three index tensor, but you can't build a, ve a, a scalar. Fortunately, there are possible terms of type uh, of type B because we can put together this vector index with the vector index that we could use, that we found before when we made the bilinear form. At first glance, there are two possible terms, U plus adjoint. Remember, the time derivative must go with this plus U plus adjoint sigma dot grad u plus. There I've put together the index in d mu with the index in v mu and had the derivative act only on u plus. I could, of course, also put the derivative on u plus adjoint. That would also be a possibility in some indices. But if I'm constructing an action, that's the same thing by integration by parts. aside from a minus sign. So in fact, since the only thing that's really important, plus surface terms which are relevant in getting the equations of motion. So in fact, I have essentially only one invariant I can use to make a Lagrangian, and it is this object, aside from a numerical factor. Everything else is not either not a Lorentz invariant or equivalent to this by integration by parts. Yes, sir? Type C allowed by two and three? Yes, certainly. It's just not Lorentz invariant. I could, for example, write d mu u plus adjoint d mu u plus. That would be fine for a Lagrangian density, except that it would not uh, be, it wouldn't be a scalar. It would be the fourth component of a vector. So you, I thought you were assuming you were only going to use first derivatives. Well, I'll integrate by parts d mu u plus adjoint. I have. That's what I've done here. This thing is our vector. Why is that rule outside here? Because there's no, there's only one vector in here. I know what all four bilinear forms I can make from this are. One of them transforms. I could make a fourth. I could by by going to fourth order and use. I could make a scalar. Things that are bilinear, and the U's don't transform like vectors. They transform like vial spinners. They're the square roots of vectors, as it were. The product of a uh, U with a U adjoint transforms like a vector. I would need four U's to make a scalar. Two U's and two U adjoints. So at the end of all this messing around, we find we have essentially a unique Lagrangian. Aside from a scale factor in front, L must be proportional to psi edge of oh, psi. Right. U plus adjoint D naught U plus plus U plus adjoint sigma dot grad U plus. The magnitude of the proportionality constant, just as in the scalar case we analyzed so long ago, can be soaked up by rescaling the U's. In order that the action be real, 
the coefficient in front has to be pure imaginary. So thus, we are left with just two choices, as in our early analysis of the scalar case, plus or minus i, u plus adjoint, d naught u plus, plus u plus adjoint. We won't be able to fix the plus or minus sign until we finally quantize this to put the theory in canonical form and compute the energy and see whether it's positive or negative. Well, I say it has to be, the coefficient has to be imaginary, so the action will be real. Okay, okay when I conjugate things, I turn this into this. And when I integrate by parts, I turn this into minus this. Whatever it's met, it has, so it's plus or minus i times some positive real number. And the positive real number I'll just absorb into the scale of u plus by redefining a scale. Is that a satisfactory answer, or do you want the equations? <laughs> Likewise, for the u minus case, which I'll keep going in parallel within brackets, if I were doing u minus, the only difference would be that's a sign of the. Uh, grad term would be different. Sorry. These are you minuses. the vector has a different uh, sign in it. <clears throat> As we'll see, this has a profound effect on the particles we finally get out of this theory. Is everybody happy with what I've done so far? I have found a unique theory up to a plus or minus sign. I now propose to explore its consequences, first on the classical level and then uh, eventually, although actually not until next lecture on the quantum level. Yes, sir, you have a question. Yeah, my question is, how come we can't have an Lagrangian for both the plus and the Oh, we can, but that would be uh, more complicated, and that's what we're going to do after we explore the U plus theory. Okay. That would be a Lagrangian with four independent fields. This is a Lagrangian with only two independent complex fields. That would be a Lagrangian with four independent complex fields. Sure. Okay. In fact, that'll be the Dirac equation. But uh, let's look at the Weyl equation first. <laughs> Now, our first step is to derive the equations of motion, we get, which we get trivially by varying the Lagrangian. The uh, u plus very adjoint, the easiest variation to do is that with respect to u plus adjoint, since we don't even have to do any integration by parts. <laughs> and we obtain the Weyl equation, d naught, u d naught plus sigma dot grad u plus equals zero. By varying with respect to u plus and integrating by parts, we just get the adjoint of this equation, as is usual for complex fields. That gives us no new information. This is the equation of motion for our two complex fields. Doesn't look like it's Lorentz invariant, but it is. We've shown it is. <laughs> of course, for u minus, we would get d naught minus sigma dot grad u minus equals zero. <coughs> the um, well, let's look. Uh, we can gain some insight into the meaning of this equation by multiplying it on the left by the operator d naught minus sigma dot grad, it d naught plus sigma dot grad, u plus equals zero. Of course, the uh, product is easy to take. 
equals, well, d naught squared. The cross terms cancel. d naught commutes with sigma dot grad. Sigma dot grad squared is del squared. Which is, of course, just what we, we expect for a massless particle. All solutions, plane wave solutions of this equation are of the form. of x equals some constant, I'll just call it u sub k, e to the plus or minus i k dot x, where k0 equals the magnitude of k. The plane waves are all plane waves like those for a massless scalar particle. And the constant in front, u sub k, I will now determine. Okay. So while this is what we expected, we only get a mass zero particle. Now let's go back to the original equation and figure out what u sub k is. For simplicity, I will consider the case k equals k naught ez. So we have a particle moving in the z direction. Oh, I should have made a remark, although this is anticipating things a bit, we would expect in the quantum theory that when we expand out the general solution to the field equation in terms of these linearly independent plane wave solutions, the coefficients of the minus k dot x type terms will be annihilation operators and the coefficient of the plus i k dot x terms will be creation operators. That's just a guess based on what we discovered for scalar theories, but the he gives us some orientation, so let's keep going with that guess. Creation and annihilation operators, of course, for mass zero particles. Now, whether we look at the plus or minus sign is irrelevant. That factors out of the equation, and indeed the magnitude of k naught factors out of the equation. So we obtain simply for, uh, let's see, d naught will give us k naught. Well, that factors out. That's just one. Grad will give us minus sigma z because of the minus sign in the inner product here. Okay, so that's a pretty easy equation to solve. The answer is we have only one solution for each value of k. The two component spinner uk is simply one zero if we use the standard representation of the sigma matrices. Work. This means that the Weyl equation has one independent solution for e one linearly independent solution for each value of the four momentum on the light cone. Thus, we would expect when we quantize this theory, we have one kind of particle for each value of the four momentum, for each momentum, one annihilation operator and one creation operator. Let's make a guess about the shape of the quantum theory and see what we can say about this particle. In particular, I'm interested in guessing what its uh, spin is. Well, it shouldn't really say spin because um, spin is a, um, a concept that applies only to particles with mass. Only to particles with mass can we Lorentz transform to the rest frame and then compute the angular momentum of the particle in the rest frame, which is a spin. The, uh, for a particle that's massless, there's no way, there is no rest frame. So we can't talk about the spin. What we can, of course, talk about is the helicity, which is the component of angular momentum along the direction of motion. 
that's perfectly reasonable. That doesn't involve the rest frame. So let's try and compute Jz, a guess about the value of Jz for the particle associated with this thing. The one particle state with this momentum. Now, again, guessing about, uh, by comparison with what we uh, got in the scalar theory, we would expect to write the quantum field as a superposition of these solutions, with some of them have annihilation operators and some of them have creation operators. Therefore, we would expect, aside from normalization factors, which are going to turn out to be irrelevant, that if we take the quantum field and look at it between the vacuum and this thing, we'll just pick out a term proportional to the annihilation operator, e to the minus i k dot x. Whoops, yeah, that's the right, that's in the right order, u sub k. Maybe with some factors, depending on how we've normalized our states. Does everyone understand why that's a reasonable guess? That's a straightforward transposition of what we discovered in the scalar theory. I'll be interested in this only at the point x equals 0, and that suffices. For the argument I'm going to do. Now, that's 1, 0, right here. Okay. And k, I'm always looking at the case where the particle moves in the z direction. Now, we would expect for a, part, a particle moving in the z direction can always be choos chosen to be an eigenstate of helicity, jz. There's only one particle, so it must automatically turn out to be an eigenstate of jz. So we'll look and see um, what the eigenstate of jz is. That is to say, I will assume e to the minus i j z theta, which is, of course, the unitary transformation that uh, affects a um, rotation about the z-axis by angle theta in the Hilbert space of the theory. <coughs> Apply to this state. Where lambda is the eigenvalue state of Jz, the what we call the helicity of a particle, this component of, of angular momentum along the direction of motion. Now, <coughs> we can compute this in two ways. Using this formula, e to the i lambda theta, vacuum, the presumed quantum field, u plus of zero, k equals vacuum, e to the plus i jz theta, u plus of zero, e to the minus i jz theta, K, because I assume the vacuum is rotationally invariant, applying that to the vacuum shouldn't do it have any effect. Why do you have e to the plus i lambda theta? Uh, sorry, because I forgot to write minus sign. Now, this of course we know, this is u of lambda adjoint. Um, you uh, field u of lambda, which transforms the field according to a certain way, and we know how exactly how that transforms. That's e to the minus i sigma z theta over two vacuum u plus of zero k. This operator just acts on the two indices of u plus, and I can bring it outside the bra and the ket without affecting anything. But I know what this vacuum expectation value is. It is this thing here. 
So I just write this as the eigenstate of sigma z with eigenvalue plus one. Yes, sir? Well, I know equals And I've just applied that for a particular case of a rotation about the z-axis. OK? D is just a numerical matrix. If I put an index on here, A, this would be uh, A, B. And I could just drag it outside. OK, A and B run from 1 to 2. Is that a satisfactory answer, or do you want more details? Now, this is an eigenstate of sigma z with eigenvalue plus 1. So this is e to the minus i theta over 2. Comparing the two sides of this equation, I see lambda equals 1 half. Thus, the particles in this theory, if there are particles, if we can successfully quantize it, the objects annihilated by u plus have felicity one half. This, of course, to have a theory which only has particles of felicity one half and does not have particles of felicity minus one half, is only possible in a theory which possesses note which the particles are massless and not parity conserve and the theory is not parity conserving. Of course, there are two kinds of particles in this theory, we guess, because this is a charged field. And therefore, the field should not only annihilate particles, but create antiparticles, just like a charged scalar field does. It will annihilate particles of charge 1 and create particles of charge minus 1. That is to say, <clears throat> there will also be the plus terms, and they will be creation operators, and they will be creation operators for different particles, not the same particle, because the field isn't real. What about the antiparticles? While the antiparticles are almost exactly the same, except to investigate the antiparticles, I have to put the state. This is now not the same state. It's an antiparticle. On the right, on the left. So it has a chance of being made. This will, of course, be proportional to the same UK, since uh, it doesn't matter whether I look at the plus or minus sign here. For the antiparticle, however, the equation I now have to study is k e to the plus i j z theta, because I always want the u adjoint on the left, equals e to the plus i lambda prime theta, antiparticle felicity. from that point on goes through in exactly the same way as before. Except this thing we're computing is either the plus i lambda prime theta instead of either the minus i lambda theta. Therefore, we get the antiparticle has helicity minus 1 half because of the sign change at this early stage in the argument. Thus, our guess, if we can successfully quantize this theory, is we'll describe massless particles and their antiparticles, since it is a charge field. The massless particles will carry one charge, and the, massless, and the antiparticles will carry the opposite charge. The particles, by definition, those objects which are annihilated by u plus, will have helicity plus 1 half, and the antiparticles, those that are created by u plus, will have helicity minus 1 half. 
Okay? That's our guess. For u minus, of course, because of the minus sign in the equations of motion, everything gets switched around. Sigma z gets replaced by minus sigma z, but otherwise nothing has changed. So for u minus, if we were to do a u minus field, particles helicity minus a half antiparticle helicity plus one half. And of course, that's what you would expect because the complex conjugate of a U plus field is a U minus field. And when we complex conjugate the fields, we change, simply change the definition of what we call particle and what we call antiparticle. This is, of course, not a, a structure alien to physics. Although when Hermann Weyl first proposed it, people thought it was. They said, dumb mathematician, no parity invariance, massless particles, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> in, fact, uh, in fact, this is precisely the structure of the neutrino, where the neutrino has one helicity. I forget whether it's plus one half or minus one half. Does anyone remember? Well, whatever it is, as conventionally defined, the antineutrino has the opposite helicity. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. I mean, we haven't, I remind you that the last 10 minutes is all guesswork. We haven't quantized this theory yet, but it's what we would expect to get if quantization proceeds along the lines it did for the scalar theories we've investigated so far. Yes, sir. What do you mean by charge? Well, there will be a conserved charge because of the symmetry, e to the i, uh, theta, phi goes, u plus goes into e to the i theta u plus. I haven't bothered to write out the current. Okay. But there, it, what it is is, in fact, just the object we called v mu, as you can readily check by putting things into our general formula. That v mu is the conserved current. But um, I wasn't planning to work that out explicitly. I was going to save that for the, for, <coughs> for the massive case. Now, we've got to go beyond this to get a particle, a theory with, uh, this is a nice theory of the free neutrino, but of course there are a lot of spin one-half particles in the world. Yes, sir, question. Well, it, it, it need not have, if it can only, it can get by with only one, we shouldn't say spin, we should say helicity. A massless, massive particle has to have every helicity between its maximum helicity and minus its maximum helicity by integer steps. A massless particle can have only one helicity. That's perfectly Lorentz invariant. It could have just 17 ha plus 17 halves. If you introduce parity invariance, then the helicity has to come, helicities have to come in pairs. If it has a helis given helicity, it must have opposite that helicity. Does that follow then to the fact that for a massless particle, you cannot uh, Lorentz transform in the particle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You can't. Okay, for a massive particle, you can always get into a fast moving jet plane, move along with the particle, and then rotate it in this rest frame to change the helicity. You can't do that for a massless particle. It can have as few as one helicity state, as little as one helicity state, if you don't impose parity. Okay. Yes, sir. No, I don't understand why a massless particle can't have the zero limit. It could. We could take a look at the mass zero limit of the Klein-Gordon. It could have zero. It could have one half. It could have one. It could have three halves. It could have four, two, you know, anything. I'm just confused because I'm thinking of photons, but then of course. The photons. photons have helicity plus one and minus one. That's because electromagnetism is parity invariant. And therefore, if plus one exists, minus one has to also exist. If electromagnetism were not parity invariant, it would be possible to conceive of a photon that only has helicity plus one. Yeah, I mean, but photons can't have helicity zero, but that has to be because they're massless. Because they're massless, they are allowed not to have helicity zero. 
You could say, they, you could always add to the electromagnetic field a massless scalar field and call the three states you get this way the photon. And then there would be helicity plus one minus one and zero. But there is nothing in the Lorentz structure of the Lorentz group that says that plus and minus one have to go to with zero if the particle is massless. You might think that is a perverse thing to do, to add a, such a scalar field, and I would agree with you, but it is certainly a possible thing to do. As Pauli said in a very similar context about uh, only using irreducible representations in a building a theory, what God has put us under, let no man put together. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, now, no, that's not the right. What God has put us under, let no man bring together. Right. <laughs> okay. So, to uh, get beyond mass zero particles and get something that has a chance of being a reasonable theory of the free electron or the free proton, we have to complicate our theory somewhat because we've done, explored everything we can reasonably do with a, um, just a U plus field or a U minus field. We also know that the interactions of the proton and the electron are parity conserving up to a excellent uh, approximation. So uh, we would like to have the free theory, the theory of the particles with no interactions to be parity conserving. So we will now try and make a parity conserving theory. To make a parity conserving theory, we need both a U plus and a U minus field. Because parity turns U plus into U minus. Thus, I want, L by linear in the fields. So I have linear equations of motion after I vary things. That's what I want for free field theory. I still want to preserve an invariance that corresponds to charge conjugation. plus or minus goes into E the i theta, u plus or minus. I don't want two conserved charges, so I don't want to say it's an independent phase transformation for u plus and u minus, just one conserved charge. Please, that's all I've got. Um, the, I want a parity invariance. And I'll assume in the first instance the most general form, u plus of x and t goes into some phase. That's my only possibility, e to the i phi 1, u minus of minus x and t. I know parity interchanges u plus and u minus, but it might multiply them by a phase. I'm going to be as general as I can. As we'll soon see, this generality is spurious. And I can uh, pin things down for some phi 1 and phi 2, fixed numbers that are determined by my theory. Any, anything like this, I don't care if a square is not 1, I'll call a parity. <laughs> Very general there. Four, I will be a little more restrictive than I was in the preceding case and assume no more than one derivative. Uh, 
Uh, I could assume two derivatives, but after all, in the previous case, I got along just fine with one derivative. So let's try one derivative here. That's even more modest than two derivatives. And if one derivative works, great. We won't have to worry about two derivatives. <laughs> Now, let's write down the most general Lagrangian. Because of condition one, we have several kinds of terms. We could have u plus adjoint, u plus, either with or without a derivative in there somewhere. We could have u minus adjoint either with or without a derivative in there somewhere. This isn't a two tensor. This is just a two vector. This is just to keep, keep things straight, either with or without a derivative. And we could have u plus adjoint, u minus, or the opposite sign combination. Now, we've already classified all the u plus adjoint, u plus, and u minus adjoint, u minus terms. And um, we've got them, so I might as well write those, these down in the beginning. And the only ones we have are with derivatives. So we have u plus adjoint, d naught u plus, plus u plus adjoint, sigma dot grad u plus, with a coefficient that must be either plus or minus. I. I'll keep that big plus or minus sign outside. The existence of our parity transformation tells us what the coefficient of the u minus term must be. The arbitrary phase factors we have introduced are irrelevant because they're canceled out in this combination. That must be plus u minus adjoint d naught u minus minus u minus adjoint sigma dot grad u minus. If this comes in with a coefficient plus 1, this must come in with a coefficient plus 1 also by parity invariance. Notice that we now see the real reason for the minus sign and the relative minus signs in the u plus u minus transformation laws. If so we can build a parity invariant theory. This term does change sign when I turn x into minus x. And therefore, it's a good thing that this one comes in with a plus sign and this one comes in with a minus sign. Now, from you, what about u plus adjoint u minus? Well, there we have to deal with u plus or minus, whichever one, transforms like d1 half 0 of lambda. U minus transforms in the other way, but the adjunction takes care of that and switches it back again. So we have to deal with things like this. For which we get d0, 0. That's a scalar. So it means we can build a scalar without uh, any worries. And this is half of an anti-symmetric tensor. <laughs> Now, the, uh, from this means that with, of this form, we can't build anything with derivatives in it because the derivative operator is a vector, and there ain't no vector here to dot things into. However, we can build a non-derivative term, which I shall now build. And what the non-derivative term is obviously uniquely defined. That's the only combination that's a scalar under rotations. So it must be the combination that's a scalar under the full Lorentz group. And by, so that the whole Lagrangian is real, m is an arbitrary number. The other possibility must be this with the conjugate coefficient. This is our most general Lagrangian. I choose to write it in this form. It involves a single arbitrary complex number, m, which I will shortly change trade for a positive real number. But at the moment, it is a single arbitrary complex number. <coughs> m is 
any questions about the derivation of this Lagrangian. It is the most general Lorentz invariant Lagrangian that satisfies our conditions and leads to a real action. Now let's get rid of the phase in M. I can always redefine u plus equals u plus prime times some phase factor e to the i phi. That's my privilege. I have that choice when writing down my Lagrangian to change variables. If I substitute that in and drop the primes, I see this term isn't affected, this term isn't affected. Of course, phi 1 and phi 2 are changed. But um, this term is affected. Its phase is changed. Therefore, I can always absorb the phase of M in a, such a transformation, and therefore, with no loss of generality, and I will drop the primes now, I can choose M to be greater than or equal to zero, simply by absorbing the phase of M in my definition of U plus. Perfectly free to do that. I then have a Lagrangian, which is, of course, this changes the definition of parity. I see the only possible definition of parity now, with m chosen to be real, and therefore these terms equal, is u plus and minus of x and t goes into some common factor, e to the i phi 1 u minus or plus of minus x and t. Once I've chosen the phase of m so that phi is, um, so that phase of u plus so that m is real, then I don't have this huge set of parities available. I only have these available. These parities are, um, are of course, I do have an infinite set of possible choices for parities, but that's reasonable because I have an infinite number of phase transformation invariances, and I can always multiply parity by an internal symmetry and declare that to be parity. That is my privilege. Just in order to have a standard parity to talk about, out of this infinite set of possible choices, it's only the total symmetry of the group of symmetries of Lagrangian that counts, not what names we give to any individual member. I will define a standard parity, which is simply the natural choice. U plus goes into U minus, and vice versa. This is purely a nomenclatural convention. If I were perverse, I could have chosen any one of these to call parity. It would also be a symmetry of the Lagrangian. Now, we now have an ugly looking Lagrangian. It's a sum of a bunch of grotesque looking terms. And uh, we can uh, simplify it somewhat since we are dealing with two objects, u plus and u minus, by assembling them together to make a big four component object instead of two, well, sorry, I shouldn't have said that quite yet. I'll run five minutes over time. That was a point I wanted to make before I said that. Um. <clears throat> now that we have our general Lagrangian, which is characterized by a single real number, exactly as many, and a plus or minus sign choice, exactly as many free parameters as we had in the corresponding case when we were writing down the free scalar field, let us uh, find out what the equations of motion are. Well, they're not hardly more complicated than before. D naught plus sigma dot grad u plus, varying this with respect to u plus adjoint and bring it onto the other side, equals m u minus. Likewise, d naught minus sigma dot grad u minus equals m u plus, since we've chosen m to be real and positive. 
Now, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to do, see what to do with this equa equation. I multiply the first one on the left by d naught minus sigma dot grad. Plus, which is del squared u plus, as before. I'm sorry, there's an i here, isn't there? Uh -huh. Better be careful. I multiply it by i sigma dot grad. Equals, <coughs> equals i d naught minus sigma dot grad m u minus by um, just applying d naught minus sigma dot grad to this equation and reading off what that is. That is m squared u plus by the second equation. Thus, u plus obeys the Klein-Gordon equation appropriate for a particle of mass m. Yes, k. Is that a minus in front of the box? Yes, it is, because I've multiplied i and i. So I've got an overall minus i. Likewise, of course, we can show by doing exactly the same thing, starting with the bottom equation, that minus del squared u minus equals m squared u minus. So I have not lied to you in my nomenclatural conventions for this free field theory. M is indeed the mass of the quantum of the field. Now let us uh, simplify our notation uh, somewhat by composing u plus, now that we at least, what the uh, spins of the particles are and so on is something we will investigate next lecture. But let us simplify our notation somewhat by introduced, by composing, uh, compounding u plus, confounding, u plus and u minus <laughs> together <laughs> into a single four component object. I will therefore define an object I will call psi, which is u plus u minus. It is a four component object. The first two components are the two components of u plus and the second two components are the two components of u minus. I will define a matrix I will call alpha, which is block diagonal sigma minus sigma. I will define a matrix I will call beta, which is block off diagonal. This is a set of four by four matrices. These matrices alpha and beta are chosen so that the Lagrangian we have written down has a rather simple form in terms of alpha, beta, and psi. To be precise, L equals plus or minus I psi adjoint d naught psi plus I psi adjoint alpha dot grad psi. That's just the two terms here, summed together in a single term by the definition of alpha, minus m psi adjoint beta psi. That's the last two terms summed together in a single term by the definition of beta. The uh, <coughs> Equation of motion we now get, of course, we can rederive directly by differentiate varying with respect to psi adjoint, is I d naught plus alpha dot grad psi equals m beta psi. This equation is <coughs> in a slightly different basis, that written down by Dirac in 1929 and it's called the Dirac equation. <clears throat> Next lecture, we will uh, <clears throat> begin exploring the properties of the Dirac equation. And since we will finding out what the solutions are, making guesses about the properties of the particles represented by those solutions, we'll go through a lot of purely algebraic labor in order to um, 
um, since we'll be living a lot with the Dirac equation, we will want to develop a sequence of algorithms for handling its solutions as effectively as possible, and we will go through all that scut work next lecture. And then at the end of next lecture, we will attempt to quantize it. Oh.